that's pretty good. Yeah. So everybody, who you're here, you're hearing is uh, Dick Robertson. He uh, he's who the Robertson School is named after. Um, so that's a pretty big deal. He he was in your shoes in back in 19 uh, mid 60s, 1960s, um, when he was a VCU student uh, at RPI. It wasn't VCU at the time. It was the last school, last class to be under the name Richmond Professional Institute. Um, and uh, he, he went from being a student in ad classes to uh, eventually uh, working his way up to being the president of Warner Brothers TV distribution. Um, he hung out with the likes of Ellen and Friends and Bugs Bunny and, and those people. Um, People's Court was a big, a big, 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 big show back in the day. Um, it was the thing that launched those court reality TVs like Judge Joe Brown and all that. Well, there was a guy named Judge Wapner back in, uh, I don't know, the mid-70s, mid-80s? I don't know. Yeah, it was uh, early 80s. Early 80s, okay. And, uh, and so, um, and Dick is one of the biggest, if not the biggest, VCU Ram fans. Um, he not only cheers but he he uh he does a lot of work for vcu uh, as an example he uh, was the chair of a vcu campaign raising money um, which broke records for the amount of money that was raised uh 167 million bucks um and uh and the campaigns before that were nowhere near that shows you the drive he has and the passion he has for VCU, and uh, and he has a whole lot of passion for each one of you. So I guess what I'll do is I'll shut up, and I'll let Dick take over. Thank you very much. Thank you for such a nice introduction, Scott. Um, I, I want to just you know I'll say a few words this morning. I want to take a lot of questions. I have some of the questions uh, that you sent me that <coughs> excuse me some of the students have been asking, but. First and foremost, I hope everybody is is uh, safe and healthy. Uh, this is my, I guess we're all in the same boat, my fifth week of being indoors. And what I've noticed in the last couple of days, things are starting to open up and, and uh, golf courses and some restaurants and things like that. So life will slowly get back to normal. This is truly a remarkable time that none of us have ever experienced before. I hope we'll never experience it again. That said, I just wanted to make a point. I'm a great student of history, uh, and I started learning about this uh, 1918, uh, what was called the Spanish flu, which is ironic, it's called the Spanish flu, since it started at Fort Riley, Kansas in the United States. It's one of the worst worldwide pandemics ever, killed, I don't know, 30, 50 million people. It was unbelievable. 700,000 died in this country alone. And yet, uh, it's sort of interesting, as, as horrible as that was at the time, we know so little about it. I think what happened was it was so scary that, that history just swept it under the rug and it was never really talked about, like World War I or World War II or things like that. You know, more people died in that, more Americans died in that pandemic than died in all the wars except for the Civil War that we've ever fought in the history of this country. So. Uh, uh, we've learned a lot. This is not as uh, viral on a virus, although it's a bad one. But uh, sort of interesting that we're all alive during this period of time. Which really leads me to the point of, of how we are, at the end of the day, uh, uh, can be responsible for our own welfare in many ways. Uh, and I've always had the attitude when I came to, well, back in those days, as Scott said, RPI, I uh, graduated in the last class of RPI in 1967 as a, a Bachelor of Science degree in advertising. Very proud of that old diploma, it says Richmond Professional Institute. Uh, and then in 1968, the, uh, the state legislature combined uh, RPI and MCB into one university, uh, even though we were obviously on split campuses and, and obviously called it BCU, so that in 2018, two years ago, we celebrated, as you know, our 50th anniversary. And, um, 
And as we did that, I had come back. I graduated in 67, so I came back from my, believe it or not, 50th college reunion in 2017. And, uh, and it, you know, you, know you pass those milestones in life and you think back on, on one's life and, and all the things that happened and, you know, what, what made, uh, uh, you know, why I, how I wound up to be that was. Uh, so I just want to share with you um, uh, some of the things that happened to me, I do not want to presume that stuff that happened to me will happen to any of you or it should happen to any of you or whatever. But I just want to let you know what is possible if you so choose. Okay, that's all I'm saying. I'm not trying to say my life is, should be a model for your life. Maybe it, sh maybe it could be, maybe not. Who knows? Uh, God made us all individuals and different. But I just want to let you know as you're going through your university career, uh, you, you, those of you who go to the Robertson School are unique in the sense that, extremely unique, uh, in the sense that you have pretty much decided, although you're still trying to find your way maybe, uh, but you pretty much decided what you want to do. You either have a, a deep and abiding interest in public relations, in journalism, or in advertising, or you wouldn't be at the Robertson School. So you've already made sort of a pre-selection that these are the three areas you want to go into. So in many ways, you're in a professional school, you're in a business school. Even though we're in the College of Humanities and Sciences, we're not a liberal arts program. You take some liberal arts courses, granted, but you're in a professional school. And so uh, you are already, let me just tell you, light years ahead of probably 95% of people out there that are thinking about what they're gonna do with the rest of their lives who have not decided. And, uh, and that was what changed my life at, uh, well, I'm gonna call it VCU, because it is VCU now. But when I was there, uh, in my sophomore year, I was taking a night class taught by an adjunct professor. By the way, uh, being in a professional school uh, in a state capital in the middle, middle of a pretty good sized city, is a huge bonus when you're studying these three uh, disciplines because Scott will tell you of all the expertise that we are able to tap into from the private sector in the form of adjunct uh, faculty. Um, and it's a real bonus. So I've been taking this class in advertising media uh, on Wednesday night, uh, right there in one of those classrooms right off of Schaefer Court. And uh, it just, it lit my fire. I went, wow, that's so interesting, learning about billboards and radio and television and how campaigns can persuade people to follow and buy certain products. And why is it when we walk down the aisle in a supermarket, we see one product and we, we tend to gravitate towards that versus something else? Or, um, or in my journalism classes, the who, what, why, when, and where. I was still writing is at the core of every single piece of journalism. No matter how the delivery systems change in social media, writing is still, great writing is still the core of everything. And so as I took that class, it lit my fire. I was an ordinary student in high school. I grew up in Norfolk, Virginia, only you know, what, 90 miles away uh, on 50th Street, went to public school my whole life. Went to Murray High School, came to uh, BCU, uh, made it, graduated in four years, I'm happy to say, but in that sophomore year, that professor told us about a job open out at Channel 12, putting up displays in supermarkets. I'm going to tell you this story to tell you about how you just never know how life will turn out. And a bunch of us went out there and applied for the job, and I got picked. So I've started putting up these displays in supermarkets on behalf of the sales department, eventually led to a sales job. I won't bore you with the details. And I started selling ads. You ready for this? Uh, minimum wage then in 1964. A dollar and twenty-five cents an hour. So I was making a buck and a quarter an hour plus five percent commission based on the collections of my sales. So I'm driving around Richmond in my old beat-up '53 Plymouth uh, while I'm taking full eighteen hours a semester, full course load, selling ads between classes. And I got uh, 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 advertisers. I'd go in and do presentations to Haverty Furniture, uh, Hawks Furniture. Uh, 
C.P. Dean Bowling and Billiard Equipment, uh, Mullen Brothers Auto Radio, uh, uh, Bradley Sport Car Center, Brad, Bradley Peugeot. I bought my first new car, Peugeot 403 from Bradley over there off of uh, Monroe Park, which is where the uh, engineering building now sits. Uh, and so um, uh, I was fortunate, and I tell you this because these internships are so valuable, I was fortunate to do this because I'm out there in the real world getting my head bashed in, trying to sell my little ads on Channel 12, uh, uh, you know, which was tough and competing against the other stations and radio and the newspaper then was really huge um, while I'm taking classes in, at, at school. So this, I, I tell you this because internships are so valuable. As you are taking these academic classes in school, uh, getting some real world experience at the same time uh, transformed my life. And it made my classroom work so much more um, valuable to me at least. And I understood it better because I was, you know, facing all the challenges one faces in life when you're in, in sales and whatnot. But what I learned was, and then after I graduated, I went to work, NBC hired me in Washington, which was very unusual they'd hire somebody so young, but I'd already had two and a half years of experience selling, which was unusual. And they gave me, they took a chance with me and it worked out. And then I went to, they promoted me to San Francisco and then sales manager in Cleveland. Then I went to New York and national sales and then CBS network in Chicago and back to CBS in New York and became vice president of marketing for CBS sports. And then I met a guy at a dinner party, long, uh, I quit, and we started a company called Telepictures, uh, moved to California, and our first big hit was, as Scott said, uh, met the producers of a show he was just starting. There was no such thing as courtroom shows, and uh, it was Judge Wapner and the People's Court, and that's what, on the back of that show, it built our company into the big company it became. We then merged with Lorimar, bought the MGM Studios, sold the whole thing to Warner Brothers, and I ran their TV company for 20 years. So that's, that's a fast version. So this stuff, all of this happened uh, to a normal person like me with a normal IQ and a normal intellect from 50th Street in Norfolk, Virginia. I'm no different from any one of you on this Zoom call today. Uh, but what I did have and what I learned through working while I was going to school was uh, uh, business uh, was not really rocket science being successful. It was about the blocking and tackling of basic fundamentals, I thought. And I've, I've preached that my entire life. I've, I've, I lectured all the years I worked out here in California. I've lectured every year, uh, two or three times a year at UCLA and two or three times a year at the Zemeca School at University of Southern California. And I talk to these students and I've also, you know, spoken to Scott, your class a couple of times, as you know, is that this is not rocket science. It, it's really, it's really about, you know, being real. Because uh, what happens is when you go out into the world to do whatever you're going to do, you're really in the persuasion business. Whether you call yourself a salesperson or not is irrelevant. We are all in sales, in my opinion. Uh, and you basically in life are in the persuasion business. And, and what I mean by that is you're pretty much trying to get people to agree with what with your point of view of what, you're, of what it is, whether you're uh, writing a newspaper article or doing a PR campaign or, or selling a newspaper ad or a radio campaign or a TV commercial or an outdoor or whatever. Uh, or if you're a creative, you're trying to persuade people to do something you want them to do. So we are, so if, so I have always come at this as, okay, uh, I'm in the persuasion business. I'm trying to persuade somebody else to my way of thinking. What's the best way to do that? And I always, and what worked for me my whole career like really well was I tried to put myself in their shoes. I tried to think if I was them and I was listening to my spiel, what would convince me if a guy like me walked in and, you know, so, what, what I found worked for me over the years was to be uh, impeccably 
prepared with research, impeccably prepared. Because particularly when you're young, like most of you, uh, you have a, uh, you just don't have the experience of most of the people you're probably gonna be dealing with who are gonna be much older and much more experienced. So how can you persuade someone if you don't carry a lot of cred with you? You know, cred is what really helps, right? Uh, Cause I've always felt it's not so much what you say, it's who somebody thinks you are when you say it. I'm gonna say that again. It's not so much what you say, it's who somebody perceives you to be when you say it. So you've got to develop some credibility to you, okay? And how do you develop that credibility? I'm gonna give you two uh, uh, specific uh, things that have worked for me my whole life fantastically. Number one is to be impeccably prepared with research. So when you go in, you have, you, 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 I'm going to use a little bit of invective. You are non-bullshittable. <laughs> okay. In other words, you got your act together. You know your data. You've done your research. And you might not have the experience, the life experience, but there's no excuse for not being prepared with impeccable research. Um, I'm going to get to how to get a job in a minute, and that really relates to research, okay? Uh, the other thing is credibility and being real, and this is maybe even more important. The biggest mistake in my life, I've been doing uh, the television business now for over 55 years, believe it or not, and uh, going back to Channel 12, and uh, the biggest mistake that I've noticed in my career with uh, people who are coming into the business who are highly motivated and, hey, look, I, I can talk like this because I've made these mistakes in the past myself and I've learned from them. But I wanna share this with you so hopefully you can learn from it too, is to, uh, is to be authentic and real. And we hear all these buzzwords, authentic and real. Well, guess what? Uh, they matter because uh, when you're particularly young and, and not, and don't have a lot of work experience, I don't care how smart you are, how great your IQ is, or what your GPA was. <clears throat> it takes 10,000 hours to learn anything. You, you've read about the 10,000 hour rule. You just, and none of you are gonna have 10,000 hours uh, at the get-go. You'll eventually get there, but it takes, it takes 10,000 hours to be good at something, if not more. And what I have found is that many young people when they're starting out and they're asked a question in a meeting or whatever, uh, be, particularly highly motivated people, uh, they, they, it is so, um, uh, I don't know what it is. It, 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 they, they, they feel that it, it would be terrible not to have an answer. And the fact is m much of the time when you're first starting out, you won't have answers because you're still in the learning phase. But what you do have is your self-esteem that you can control and the knowledge that uh, the best way to develop credibility with someone is to be honest and to be real. And what I'll, the biggest mistake young people make is they, when they ask a question that they, even if you think you should know the answer, the fact that you don't is a fact, okay? And they will make up an answer. And the person they're talking to 95% of the time will not respond by saying, well, that's, where, where'd you come up with that crap? That, that's the dumbest thing ever. They won't say that. You know what happens? You are immediately dead with them because they will, they, will, they, they, they will identify you right then and there as a bullshitter. And, and, you will, and nothing you will say from that point forward will matter because you're not real and it's over. And most people don't want to deal, uh, uh, most people on the other side don't want to deal with confrontation. So they just won't say anything and fine, uh, we'll get back to you and you'll never hear from them again, okay? Uh, um, so how do you deal with that when somebody asks you a question and, and, you, and you don't know the answer to? The, there's only one answer. And if you can have the brains and the self-esteem and the smarts to do this, 
This is the greatest gift I could ever give anybody on this Zoom call today. Simply say, I don't know. It's okay not to know. You're not expected to know everything. And here's another one. Even if you should have known the answer to this question and you don't, there still is only one answer. I don't know. You can even say, geez, that's a good question. I, I, I feel like I really should have known the answer to that question. But to tell you, Mr. or Mrs. So-and-so, I, I don't know. But I'll tell you what, I'm going to find out right away when this meeting is over. I'm going to get back to you immediately. What I just told you is the greatest advice, in my opinion, you could ever get about being successful in business or perhaps even in life. Because that then immediately puts you into the top one or two or three percent of people. <laughs> I know this sounds harsh, that you're likely to come into contact in the world that are honest and real and authentic. Because they have the self esteem to be real. They have the self-esteem to be authentic. They have the self-esteem to say, geez, I don't know, but, and then follow up fast. Get that answer, research it, make sure you're on point, and then get back to that person immediately. Let me tell you something. If you can do that, you will own the world, quote unquote, uh, in my opinion, and both in your personal life and your professional life to have the self-esteem to, 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 to be authentic and real. And, and I'm telling you, people like that are like magnets. They attract people around them. I, I, I made a couple of notes to myself, you know, uh, about this call this morning. And I said, because what we are in life is, particularly when you go to college and, and you're particularly to a professional program like this, you are in the persuasion business. Trying to get people to do something you want them to do. Whether you write a, a uh, 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 a journalism article, or you develop a PR campaign, or you do an advertising campaign. You create one or sell one. You're in the persuasion business. Let me tell you another thing that I've learned in life that is apropos to this, is that things in life, and I, and I, and I put this out there for people's political persuasions as well. It's irrespective whether you're conservative or progressive. Uh, but what I think we should all keep in mind is that things in life are rarely black and white. Things in life are usually shades of gray. And when you take a black or white, a black and white position consistently, you, you, you become transparently uh, non-believable. And because things are rarely black and white, you might not like Obama, but Obama didn't do everything wrong, even if you didn't like him. You might not like Trump, but Trump doesn't do everything wrong even if you don't like it, okay? And this is my point, is that you can't just, because you, and in business, it's never black and white, it's all about grades. So how do you get, how do you win uh, uh, what I call, what I thought always helped me by trying to be authentic and be honest? I, I felt that in sales, nobody's gonna buy from me because they necessarily like me. Uh, they're, not gonna, they're not gonna buy something if they think they can get a better program or a better deal from somebody else just because they like me. That said, they shouldn't, okay? But most things are not that black and white. When it comes down to people making decisions, you know, it's kind of like this. So what I, I had always tried to position myself and our team and our sales staff and talk to all my salespeople my whole life is you hope to develop the kind of relationship with your customers uh, and, with your, and with your public where if it's a real, real close call, you kind of get the nod because of your authenticity, the fact that they do like you, that's not a bad thing but that you win the close ones or you win the ties. And, um, and that's how life works. Life, uh, uh, because life is about uh, being successful out there. It's about winning the close ones. Because rarely are there these lopsided victories you have in business. It's very rare. It's almost non-existent. Every now and then you get lucky and 
the fish jumps in the back of the boat, but trust me, it happens once or twice in your life. It happened with us with Judge Walker, thank you. But, but basically, it's all about winning the kind of, it's, it's, it, it's the close wins or somewhat close, and, and that's what it's about. And that's why they say it takes 10,000 hours to be good at something. Because um, it's these little nuances that, that push different points of view over the top. So that's my main uh, general you know, spiel. I, I also felt this, and I want to share this with you. Uh, I grew up in Norfolk, Virginia on 50th Street, went to Larchmont Elementary, Blair Junior High School, Murray High School, uh, VCU. I went to public schools my whole life and never went to a fancy private school. I didn't even go to kindergarten. I'm not even sure they had kindergarten when I was a kid, but you know, now they got preschool and kindergarten and all this stuff. Um, and so when I went out to, the, when I got hired by NBC, I'm competing with, I want you to really listen to this. I was competing with all of these uh, high-powered uh, men and women, mostly men in those days, from uh, uh, Northeastern schools, a lot of Ivy League schools that were working at NBC and CBS and all that. And when I first started out, I had, and this was my own bias, I had a little bit of uh, maybe low self-esteem that I had not gone to one of these elite schools or blah, 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 and all that. And what I learned real fast is that it, the education I got at VCU was the greatest education on the planet because we, the vast majority of us were first generation students, not, not everybody, but I think still to this day, Scott, over 40% of VCU freshmen coming in are first gens uh, that go to college, as, I, as was I. My parents didn't, never went to college. So I didn't have a background, a family background where they could mentor me and uh, we had nothing, I didn't know what to expect when I went to college and I kind of struggled in the beginning. Uh, we now have at VCU something called, as you know, University College that helps first geners now uh, understand college life and all that. But coming, <laughs> coming to VCU, I had had this, and when I went out into the business world, I realized that this education I got was in so many ways, and a lot of it had to do with working at Channel 12 at the same time I was taking my classes and being taught by a great faculty as well as a great adjunct faculty. And what I realized is what made the difference, because now I'm competing with all these people, and why I uh, was able to rise in the organization uh, as fast as I did, uh, was because uh, of the blocking and tackling of common sense. I was always, here's a big one, be on time. One of the worst, one of the worst things you can do to disrespect another person is to be late or uh, particularly uh, chronically late. It basically says, I don't care about you. Your, your time is not important to me. Only my time is important to me. Be on time. Number two, uh, I made it a rule in my life all the way through Warner Brothers when I was making two and a half million dollars a year as president of Warner Brothers Television Distribution. I returned every phone call every day, even if it was eight o'clock at night before I went home. I never went home from the office without returning a phone call. Um, it basically said, what does that say to people? You matter to me. You're important. I'm going to call you back. And a lot of times, remember, I'm in California. I'm leaving, and obviously they've already gone home. So it's 5, 5.30, 6 o'clock, 6.30 for me. That's 9.30 back east, 8.30 in Chicago. I know they're at home. But I left a message on their office phone. Hi, this is Dick. Sorry I missed you. I've been in a meeting all afternoon long. I just wanted to get back and say hi. Please call me in the morning first thing, or I'll call you in the morning first thing. Have a great evening, good night. And I would sit there with a stack, 20 or 30 of these, and I'd finish them before I go home and get in the car and drive home. I did it every day. I never once, uh, well, I should say never, but, but I mean, I, I hardly ever didn't return a phone call. So that, that's because that tells people, remember what I said, you're in the persuasion business. You wanna win the close ones, you do stuff like this. 
Okay, here's another thing I did that people used to joke about me. <clears throat> but it's a little technique that I found worked great for me. Uh, my assistant and I, would, with all of my key clients and their family members, if we could find out, I would find out their birthdays. And now with computers, you put it in your computer, and the first thing I get to work, there might be six people. And I would, we would type out a little birthday message and send somebody a, a message on the, I mean, so easy with email or, you know, and social media. Uh, and I would send them a birthday a greeting. Happy birthday, Dick. Hope you're having a great day. What does that say to somebody? It says that you matter to me. And when it comes down to a $200 million deal and it's either you or the guy at Paramount, and it's a close call, did the birthday messages make a difference? Hard to say, but they sure didn't hurt. Because we're talking about when in the close ones, you know? And also, it made me feel good. It, it, it made me feel good. It made them feel good on a personal, human, emotional level. And again, you're going out into business and you're in the persuasion business. Now, I'm not, when I say you're in the persuasion, I'm not talking about uh, tricking people or using tricky techniques to get somebody to do. I'm talking about being authentic and real. I believe this stuff. I really do. And it comes off as genuine, I hope. And because uh, it is. And it worked. It, it worked for me tremendously. Um, let me take a couple of these questions that you sent me. And please feel free, uh, Scott, you can, uh, however you want to, you know, people can put up their hand on the chat thing or whatever. But uh, to ask me questions, but um, uh, let, let me just read some that you sent me. You said, uh, Mr. Robertson has probably met more successful business people, and he has had a lot of success too. I would like to ask him, what are the three traits or skills that most successful people have in common? Okay. You will hear most people say in, in books, you got to work hard. You got to work really hard. Hard work is what wins. That's the tiebreak. Well, of course, hard work is what wins. I mean, duh. But uh working hard is not enough trust me if you don't work smart and hard it ain't gonna happen so just working hard doesn't get it done you've got to be smart you got to think you got and, and back to what i was saying earlier you got to be authentic i once had a friend of mine who was a tennis pro and you've heard people say practice makes perfect and he said bs practice does not make perfect i said what do you mean he said Perfect practice makes perfect. That's kind of what I'm saying here. If you're trying to be a better golfer and you go out there and you're a crummy golfer and you don't take lessons and you just keep grooving this crummy swing of yours all the time and hitting 500 golf balls every day to practice, you're just making yourself worse. <laughs> you're not getting better. You're better off just not practicing unless you practice in a proper fashion. Same way with work. You got to work hard. Of course, you have to work hard. That's a given, you know. But you also have to work smart, not just hard. And then, you know, I've already answered this in a way: is be authentic, be real, have the self-esteem to say, "I don't know. I'll find out. I'll get back to you." Be honest in meetings. Be kind. Life is short. Okay, if you were our age. Would you major in advertising again? If yes, what part of the advertising business? Well, uh, yes, I would. Advertising, well, the, you know, it's ironic. I'm working hard now with uh, Dr. Rao, our provost, uh, our interim director of the Robertson School, and also Mar uh, uh, Marcus uh, Messner, and also Marcel, and our advisory board to hopefully someday uh, have our uh, Robertson School achieve independent status within the university, have our own dean, have our own building, hopefully, and this is my dream, okay? That said, one of the things we're using and we're, as we're lobbying uh, Dr. Rao and uh, Provost Hackett and our new dean when they come in from the college is that there are not, there's never been a hotter time for the three disciplines that we teach at our school. That is journalism, PR, and advertising. They've never been hotter. And universities want to teach stuff that is relevant, obviously. 
so that when you walk out well, in the old days of the Richmond Coliseum, I guess those days are gone, right? But uh, when you uh, 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 get your degree and go out into the world, that you've got something that, that you have learned that you can go to work day one out of school. And hopefully you've been working while you're in school uh, with uh, meaningful uh, internships. Um, but those three, yes. And what area, that, that's really a personal thing. I, my skills in my, were in sales, okay? I, I, I was good in develop, sell, selling advertising and all of that sort of thing. And then I got into creating advertising once I started running these companies and developing campaigns. But we really had advertising agencies work for us, had an advertising department. So I really found a great deal of joy in the creation of advertising later in my career. So I think uh, creating advertising, I think one of the most underserved areas of the advertising business that a lot of people don't even understand exists is media planning. In other words, planning a campaign with the client. This is at the very core of what the advertising business, Scott, I would say is all about, is media planning. And a lot of people don't even know what a media planner does. But the media department at a big company or an advertising agency uh, who executes the buys the advertising? They don't. They get a plan from the planning department. It is. It all starts with the media plan, and the media plan can have a lot to do with the creative approach. So it's all tied together. But I find that media, media planning, media sales uh, is great. Is a great part of the advertising business, and also creating advertising is immensely uh, popular. Uh, you know, it's it, it's what drives. Uh, most clients to move from one agency to another. But what's happened during my time, back in my day, all of the media functions of advertising were usually under one advertising agency. Now they're split. You have, uh, uh, Procter & Gamble can have five agencies, a couple of them buy the media, a couple of them plan the media, they may have two or three doing creative for different brands. It's all, it's all, these disciplines are so, uh, they may ha have one agency just for social media and digital. Um, it's, uh, so there's so many more opportunities now. And when I was, the reason, uh, it gives me a good opportunity why we changed the name of the school from <coughs> the uh, School of Mass Communications to the School of Media and Culture was simply because, uh, and Scott was all part of voting for this. Remember Scott, it took us about a year to get this through all the, university uh, bureaucracy uh, uh, and chef, but uh, what, we, what we felt was uh, as we were transitioning in our new modern digital world, that the concept of mass communication, while still very important, has really, has really transitioned and morphed into more of a rifle approach than a shotgun approach. It's not as mass as it once was. We now have direct campaigns, social media, we have bloggers, we have people who uh, now can, uh, we have streaming. Uh, we have 150 channels, not three networks. Uh, so that's one thing that it's not just mass anymore. It's more segmented. So we also felt that to understand how to persuade an audience, because remember I talked about being in the persuasion business, whether you're in the persuasion business one-on-one -on -one or more of a mass persuasion, or big picture persuasion, is, is the um, uh, uh, go, going through, uh, I, I lost my train of thought. All right, so now let's go to the next one. At what point did you know that you had made it? Uh, okay, that's a good question, I thought about it. All right, so I had done real well at NBC and they kept promoting me and I got to New York, then I quit, went to CBS big network sales guy in Chicago calling on Leo Burnett, J. Walter Thompson and, and everything. Then went back to New York, became the second or third youngest vice president ever at CBS as a charge of sports marketing. But I always wanted to be in business for myself. And I met this guy and anyways, 30 days later, we started this business. And uh, it was really hard because we, we didn't have much product. I moved to California trying to find stuff for us to sell. Uh, I'm out there and I'm thinking uh, uh, it was really tough and not much was happening. And I thought, wow, 
there were nights when I would just sit there and think, why did I ever leave my big fancy job at Black Rock at CBS, eating lunch across the street at Il Manello and having an expensive count and going to the U.S. Open tennis and sitting in the box and, and having all the perks and privileges of my network vice presidency and, and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, it was easy to make that, to try it. And I would try my best to try and stop that tape from running around my head, uh, putting those bad negative thoughts in my head, but sometimes I couldn't help it because it wasn't happening. And then finally, I kept going. I didn't quit. You know, there's an old saying, you know, uh, cliches get to be cliches. Why? Because they're true. <laughs> but I kept going. I didn't quit. And uh, 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 so um, uh, we, we had a devastating, uh, uh, we thought we were going to do the Tony Orlando talk show. We fly all our salespeople to Vegas. We couldn't afford it. We take a couple of clients to his big show at Susan's Palace. We go backstage after the show, and he announces he's decided not to do the talk show. It's like one of my lowest points in my career. And we had spent all this money, and I thought, oh, no, no, this is like pouring salt in a wound. And I went back to L.A., and then uh, my, one of my partners in New York called me and said, hey, there's this, they're taping a pilot over at KTLA. Uh, William Morris, the big agency, said, do you want to go over? So anyway, I go over there. I walk in this studio, here's this courtroom set. Uh, this judge comes out in this white hair. They do this small claims case, something. This is the dumbest thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Who would want to watch this on television? And it was the pilot for the People's Court with Judge Twatner, which went on to, it's still on television today with Judge Millian 30 years later. It's made billions of dollars, it's unbelievable. So I'm sitting there watching this thing. I take it, we sell it. Uh, that fall, it goes on the air. And then we had overnight ratings in only three cities. Now there's like 60 cities, but just New York, LA, and Chicago. So it ran on Monday. So the first ratings came in uh, two days later on Wednesday. So we got Monday's ratings on Wednesdays, Tuesdays on Thursdays, Wednesdays on Friday. And by the end of the first week, we knew that we had one of the biggest new hits in the history of what's called first-run television. That is shows that were made directly for TV stations, not the network. And that's when I knew we had made it. That would be the answer to that question, because I knew that on the back of that show, uh, we built our entire company. And then we went on to do Love Connection and blah, blah, blah. Um, what would you change about the Robertson School of Media and Culture? Uh, the only thing I would change is, um, uh, Hopefully someday we can achieve independent status. All We want to be a top 25 school in the country. Uh, the way all the other top 25 schools have three things in common. One, they're independent. They have a dean. They have a PhD program. And now currently we're part of the College of Humanities and Sciences, which is not a bad thing. Uh, but long term, ultimately, uh, we want to achieve independent status. In the meantime, let me just tell you something. Uh, I have seen, I, I've got re-involved re at VCU back in uh, uh, 19, uh, well, uh, uh, in the late 90s. And uh, we had some, uh, we had some real issues with the faculty back then. Uh, we couldn't find a director. It was a, it was a mess, to tell you the truth. And the university uh, was 50-50 on whether the program should even continue. To tell you to be perfectly honest, I told you I'm an authentic person. Most people said, "Oh, Dick, you should never say that to a Zoom, Zoom class of students." But it was the truth. Why? Why should you be ever afraid of the truth? And so um, uh, we then finally found a uh, uh, a director, and she came in and uh, and uh, trans helped helped us transform the school, and we formed a, uh, uh, the president of the university at the time, Dr. Trani, asked me to form a advisory committee I did, uh, we recommended that first thing the school do is become accredited. It was not accredited. So she slowly started working through all of these faculty problems we had. We had some ba big ones, okay, with some various professors who had tenure that we couldn't get rid of that were not productive and were actually counterproductive. Anyway, so she slowly, one by one by one by one, solved the faculty problem, and as she did, we had people come into our faculty that have transformed the school. One of them is on the Zoom call right now, uh, 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 Scott Sherman. And um, 
and we were able with this whole new, you know, those like this is like not your father's Oldsmobile, uh, attract people uh, like Bill Oglesby, and I, I don't want to leave people out, but you know, just uh, uh, Bridget and uh, uh, all these magnificent, uh, uh, talented uh, people, and and even Clarence, who comes from Norfolk, Virginia, he's one of my best friends, uh, who's a great guy, and so. We, we today, I can tell you, have a top 25 faculty, my opinion. I, I've been around to these other schools, uh, uh, Syracuse and, and, and uh, uh, North Carolina and the uh, University of Pennsylvania and uh, the radio and TV department in Texas and the Zemecca School at SC. And I got to tell you, you're going to school now with a faculty that's as good as any one of them. We just have to build our endowment up. Uh, uh, get our independence and get a PhD program and get out of that temple building. <laughs> uh, and, um, and, uh, and, and I believe we can do it. So that's the answer to that question. Um, what do you wish for us? What do you wish we'd make happen to ensure our individual success? Um, I think I've answered that question. Be real, be authentic, get, a, uh, get, get an internship, start to work. Think about what you really want to do. Uh, and, all, and, 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 and what you may have previously thought you wanted to do when you go out there and start doing it, you may discover that it's not your thing, that you thought it was your thing, but it's not. Well, don't waste a lot of time chasing something that's not working for you. Get out and go do something else. Uh, it, it, your, your job should be something that you don't hate, that you're just doing for money. And I loved what I did from day one putting up those displays in supermarkets for Channel 12 in Richmond, driving my old Plymouth around. And I got lucky. Uh, but um, uh, I, I strongly recommend that uh, you got to get working fast and find something you really love. And if it's not working, then change. Don't be afraid to change. Was it hard for your generation to get a good job after college? It seems like it was easier back then. Hard for me to say, uh, uh, I think it's always hard. But if you are, if you show up one time and you are special, oh, let, let, here's a great uh, tip for a, uh, that I teach and uh, that I would teach at USC and UCLA is how to get a job. Uh, there should be a, I think, Scott, is there a course at VCU on how to get a job? Yes, we've got, uh, we've got in PR, there's a class called PR uh, professionalism in PR, excuse me, and in advertising, we have a class called Career Minded. They're both focused on, you know, job interviews and, and getting a okay. job. All right, well, maybe the next time I'm back home, uh, I'd love to visit those classes because here's what I found. I, you know, I, 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 for the last 30 years of my business, I was like the president of the company, so I didn't really interview people for entry level jobs that you're applying for, except. When one of my big customers would call me, big clients, and say, my son or daughter just graduated from wherever, uh, they're coming to LA, uh, could you meet with them? I said, well, of course, because why? I'm in the persuasion business. I said, yes. Uh, um, and they would come, and, and not all the time, but the vast majority of the time, these kids would come in my office, sit on my couch. Uh, maybe their body language wasn't the greatest, which pissed me off. I thought, you know, a little bit disrespectful and it just showed a lack of respect and preparation. I mean, if you're trying to persuade me to give you a job, why are you sitting like that? You know what I mean? <laughs> just, I'm telling you, little stuff matters. So then, uh, oftentimes they would say stuff like, well, I've always wanted to be in the entertainment business. I've always loved the movies. Always thought I'd be good in the TV business. And I'm thinking, what planet did these people, how did they get a 4.0 from the University of Michigan? Uh, how is that possible? So I would let them finish and then I would politely say, well, let me, I, I can either be really polite or I can tell you the truth. What do you want? They said, oh, Mr. Robertson, we want the truth. I said, well, with an attitude like that, you got two chances of getting a job yet. Slim and none and slim just left. <laughs> and, and they would like, their eyes would get big. And we said, what? I said, don't you have any idea what this is about, this meeting? First of all, I don't meet with people like you. The only reason I'm doing it is to be nice to, nice to your father or your mother, because they're a big customer of mine. That's why I'm meeting. I tell them this. Number two, 
uh, I got people just as smart as you waiting around the corner on the street to walk through a brick wall to work here. And you're sitting there, not with great body language, I might add, <coughs> saying, <coughs> you, you want to work here because you think you like the movie business or the television business? I said, do you think, did you th do you think that that's going to persuade me to want to hire you? I want to hire people that can sell like crazy for us, that are willing to go through brick walls for us, that are so persuasive and prepared. And if this is all you're doing to prepare yourself, your most important asset, then how are you going to prepare for our pro programs and our projects? You're telling me that if you're not that important to yourself, then how, is, how, how are you going to work for us? And they would just be dumbfounded. And I said, I said, we're a public company. So here's what you, here's the first thing you do. And I'll, I'll give you a great tip for getting a job. Most companies are public companies that, and they have uh, uh, annual reports. If you haven't read the annual report before you go into that country company, shame on you. You got to figure out how people get their money and what's important to them. Remember, I'm not interviewing you. Let's say I'm not interviewing you for what I can do for you. I'm interviewing you for what you can do for me. I'm the one that's hiring. So the attitude has to be when you go out for a job is why, when you go into that meeting, why, how can I convince this person that I'm right for their company? Why should they hire me over all these other people out there? Not that I need a job. They could give a shit whether you need a job or not. Okay. You, you're going in there to try and convince them that they should hire you rather than the other hundred people that are out there trying to get that one job. So you've got to build a presentation. Read their annual report. Find out how they get their money. Maybe you find uh, some people that work at the company and do some research. And if you come in with maybe a little PowerPoint or a little flip card or just some knowledge about the company and then you say, I've thought about this. I think I could be Mr. Robertson really good in your blah, 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 department, because this is my, uh, uh, here's my book from college, and, and this is what I did in school. I think I can apply this really well to this area of your company that you do. I've talked to a couple of the people that work here, blah, blah, blah. If you just did that, you would be in the top 1% of people that interview for jobs. I'm telling you, you'd be in the top 1% because you, you, you did a little research, you did a little work, and you basically are saying to that person, that recruiter or, or that person that's hiring, uh, I got my you know what together. And I'm a serious person. And I want to work here. And I'm going to be good. And I did my research. I didn't just come in and say I need a job. Who cares? A lot of people need a job. I, they're not hiring you to help you. They're hiring you to help themselves. So that's the mindset you have to have when you go for a job. All right. Uh, it's hiring an when hiring an entry level person, what do you look for? Authenticity. I've already answered that. Um, uh, okay. Now that's that's most of the. I think that's all the questions you sent me, Scott. Uh, we have a few minutes, I think, for any questions. Yes, five. Five minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody want to ask a question? I was wondering. So you've had a fantastic career. Um, obviously, have you, what's, do you have any regrets over the course of your entire career that like you wish you had made a different decision or, uh, gone a different direction? Yeah, I, I think as I got older, uh, I wish I'd have been a little bit nicer person when I was younger. I was too, uh, uh tightly wound and too, uh, uh, judgmental and unforgiving as a younger person. And when I got older in management, I realized that you, you, you uh, can get a better results out of being more collegial and more uh, and less confrontational. Uh, and that just came with age and experience. Uh, but it's, it's uh, the, way I was, the way I was wound. It, it, uh, you don't have to be a jerk to be successful, okay? You can be a kind, human being with 
sympathy for other people's feelings and points of view. And in the end, that works better. You can get, I will, I will tell you, you can be a jerk and a tyrant, a yeller and a screamer, and that will uh, at times deliver sh a results, but only short term. You, and, and, and the damage you do, the dead bodies you leave along the way are not worth it because they're only short term. You want long term success. You want a happy, effective workforce. When I started changing my, my, my way of working with my team and everything and, and giving more uh, authority to the team, they became happier and more productive and we made more money and I didn't have to work 70 hours a week either. You know what I mean? So. Thank you. You're welcome. Who's next? One more question. Oh, I never did answer the question, media and culture. So why did we change the name? So because you can you 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 persuade people by now the use of all these different media that we have. It's not just the mass com, radio, TV, you know, it's everything, social media and all kinds of uh, all kinds of ways of uh, guerrilla marketing. Uh, whatnot. And um, uh, I mean, there's all ways to sell and market. Uh, and then culture is because you need to understand the culture of difference between Gen Xers, millennials, boomers like myself. We all respond to messages in different ways. And we need to more than ever understand the different cultures out there that make up a, a client's audience, whether it's a newspaper, a TV station, a radio station, a blog, uh, any kind of social media platform uh, or a company's uh, products. So we need to understand the culture. So media, how you, how, you, how you use the media to get to these various cultures. It's not just one big blob of people out there anymore that you need to talk to because your message doesn't, oh, and I can tell you one of the coolest things, Scott, that's happening now is uh, with these uh, smart TVs, which are really dumb computers now, uh, you can, um, uh, direct uh, messages. So you can, for example, now buy, there is, it's a great company, these companies are doing it. You can buy a commercial now for one of the networks, uh, you know, that was heretofore seen nationally across the country simultaneously, right? In, in, a, in a prime time show like Big Bang Theory or whatever like that. Well, now you can buy that same commercial from, from the network but you can, uh, you can now send basically two or three different actual creative co commercials over that one buy to the country. So you can send, you can send one to people uh, who have uh, female heads of houses and you can change the creative. You can send one to maybe the African-American community if you wanted to create a special commercial for that. You can send one to, you know, blah, blah, blah. So uh, this is very exciting. So you can now can segment uh, uh, your creative approach with just one buy, rather than having to make three buys to send three different commercials to everybody that might not be as germane. Any and, questions? Yeah, sounds like it. I, I just would like to finish by saying, uh, in uh, uh, all the years, that uh, I have come back and got reinvolved with VCU back in the late 90s, uh, originally with Dr. Trani, uh, and then, and then uh, chairing the capital campaign that Scott talked about, uh, which was successful. And, uh, and then I had been a donor. Uh, you know, I'm not some super, super rich guy, but I did okay. Uh, but I've been a donor, a serious donor to VCU on the academic campus over the years. And the reason is, is that but not for those four years between, believe it or not, 1963 and 1967. I thought to myself, my God, how my life might have been different. Might have been okay, but who knows. But this uh, education that I received right there on Schaefer Court, those, those classrooms and some of those old brownstone buildings, it's a much different campus now. But uh, it transformed my life. It really did. And I, as I went through my life, I looked back on it and I thought, you know, um, if somebody like me doesn't give back to my alma mater, then who? And if not now, then when? And that's when I became uh, re-involved with the school, uh, uh, not only with my time, but with my money. And I did that. Um, 
and then eventually they named the school after me. Uh, and I, I can tell you right now, and I say this to every faculty member, we, our faculty is so great and our students are so great. I have never been more proud to have my name associated with anything on the planet than I am with this school. Uh, it has given me uh, so much pleasure uh, and I am so proud of you and what each of you have done. I really am. I, I get all the messages, Scott, every day from Marcus and Marcel about all the achievements of our students. Uh, we have one coming out here that got a big uh, job at the LA Times, I forget her name, but I just sent her a nice note. Uh, Marcus, is, uh, our faculty is without peer almost in the mid-Atlantic states of the awards that it gets. Uh, it is night and day from the problems we had in the past, and which encourages me uh, that we're going to uh, uh, hopefully someday soon achieve our independent status than the university. But um, everyone on this call and everyone that sees it uh, uh, on a replay, please know, I mean, I know this because I go to these other schools, you are going to a world-class university in journalism, public relations and advertising. I mean, world-class. Uh, and you're in a capital city, uh, uh, one of the hottest uh, top 50 markets in the country. I know every time I come home, I can't believe all the new restaurants that have opened. I mean, who knew Richmond, Virginia was gonna be the restaurant capital of the East Coast uh, or the new restaurant capital of the East Coast. And uh, uh, it's just a great time to be uh, uh, I think a student at VCU living in the city of Richmond uh, and going to this school. It's got uh, the right leadership in Dr. Rao, a president, a board of trust. I was on the board of visitors for eight years. Got a great board that cares so deeply about the school. Uh, you know, we, we have issues with funding, all public universities do. But what our biggest issue now at the Robertson School is enrollment. Our enrollment has gone from 1,200 down to 800, but that's happened across the university and across America. We need to get our enrollment up. We are starting a major push uh, that Marcus and Marcel are going to lead with the advisory board helping, backed by all the faculty to help. And, and so uh, the, old, the old saying, God helps those who help themselves. We need to really, all of us, students, uh, staff, faculty, we need to get our enrollment back to where it was. We need to get it back to 1,000. I think we could get it up to 1,400. And if we can do that, we can achieve independence. Because there's no reason why we shouldn't. We have a world-class faculty. Hopefully in a couple of years, we're gonna be moving out of the Temple Building into a new, new building, hopefully. Um, and, uh, and you've got the faculty and the adjuncts in the city that, uh, that you're gonna get as good an education as you can anywhere in the country. And, and then also in a beautiful place, Richmond, Virginia. So anyway, that's well, gotta go. But. That's, thank you very much, Dick. Um, you know, I, I think you gave us some good insights, some good, some good uh, advice to be authentic. And, and I think when somebody is, is working with, is, is being authentic and working with authenticity, they're able to do sort of the second thing, which is to be passionate because it's just so much easier when you believe in what you're doing, you can give it the go. And, and when you've got that passion, success comes. And, and however you measure success, however you want to define it for yourself, then, right. then that's great. That's and, what, no, and nobody, and Scott, nobody can take that away from you. Right. Ever. You and, own that. Nobody can take it away from you. And, you did, and I learned you didn't have to go to Princeton or Harvard or Yale or any of those schools to get yeah. this great education that we got at VC. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and what you got to do is get out there and be authentic and real and have self-esteem and show up on time and work hard and work smart and do your research and, and, and remember people's birthdays. <laughs> <laughs> When's your birthday, Dick? August 23rd, 1945. <laughs> okay. Got it. Okay. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you, everybody. God bless you. Uh, I love all the Robertson, Robertsonians, as we say. And uh, uh, go Rams. And uh, 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 as we say out here in Hollywood, break a leg. Thank, thank you very you. much.